Welcome um, to the School of Law um, for this really, really uh, important event. My name is Alastair Mullis, by the way. I'm, uh, I'm the head of the, the school, and it's a real pleasure um, for me to welcome, uh, welcome you all here uh, this evening. These events are incredibly important uh, events. And first of all, of course, they, they offer us an opportunity to showcase one of our new stars, uh, as it were, to, uh, uh, to, to the world. And we're obviously delighted uh, that Oliver is, uh, is joining us uh, and really looking forward to what he's, what he's got to say. Uh, Anna Lawson will say a few, few words about, uh, <coughs> about Oliver before, before he starts. Um, but there's also uh, another, I think, equal importance uh, of, uh, of these events, which is really for us to welcome Oliver uh, into our community. Uh, and it is a community. Uh, it's a community of scholars, community of, uh, of students, um, community of our, our wider uh, <coughs> alumni. But also, and I think what's particularly nice about, uh, uh, about this event, a community of, of friends. Uh, and I'm obviously delighted that, that Oliver's mother and stepfather are, are here, and Oliver's partner uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is here for, for, for this evening. Uh, and other friends of, uh, of, uh, of Oliver's are here for, for, this, uh, for this event, because uh, it is, uh, it's an important event in his life, uh, it's an important event in, uh, in the life of the, the school. And Oliver is joining a school that is, that is thriving. No sense of complacency about how we are thriving, um, but, uh, but we are thriving. Uh, there is a sense in which this school is, uh, is, is very much uh, going in, uh, in, in the right direction in, in everything we do in terms of, in terms of our research, uh, in terms of the way uh, we teach and look after our, our students. And Oliver joins a very, very successful centre, uh, Centre for Law, uh, and social justice, which Michael Thompson and Judy Wallbank, who I presume is here somewhere. Where's Judy? She's going to be late. Right, OK. <laughs> She's doing the other part of ensuring we have a successful, thriving uh, community. But, uh, but Michael and Judy have, uh, have led the establishment of, uh, of the Centre for, for Law and Social Justice, of which the Disability Law Hub is a hugely important part. Uh, and Oliver joins uh, a, uh, a group of the largest number of disability lawyers in the world. I'm going to continue saying that, uh, and eventually it'll be true, I think. In, uh, um, uh, but disability law is a hugely important part uh, of, uh, of what we do here. It is something that we're very proud of in terms of the scholarship that is, uh, is produced. Rather more importantly, uh, of the impact that my colleagues make uh, on the world. Um, and uh, Oliver, of course, is, uh, is a classic example of somebody who is a fine scholar, uh, but is also somebody who has made a very considerable distance, difference uh, to, uh, to the world, and we're obviously delighted that, uh, that he's joining us. Now, I don't want to steal Anna's th thunder. I'm, sort of, she's, I'm looking at her, and she's thinking, oh, God, he's off, uh, <laughs> off again, and, and he's going to say everything that I was about to say about, uh, uh, about Oliver. But all I really want to do is, is, is to say to, to Oliver, uh, welcome to the school. We're delighted uh, that you are, are joining us. To everybody else uh, in the room, uh, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Uh, and now to hand over to uh, Anna Lawson. First of all, I just want to follow Alistair in welcoming everybody here. Um, it's so fantastic to meet people who I've met in all sorts of corners of the world, but never all together in Leeds before. And thank you, Oliver, for bringing them all here. It's great. Um, but the main thing, of course, is to welcome Oliver. And I can't, I can't sum up Oliver because I think it's an impossible task. Um, I feel like I'm sure all of you do that what Oliver manages to fit into one lifetime is, is it, should, it should be about five different lifetimes. <laughs> um, I first met Oliver in about 2003 when he came to give a seminar for the Centre for D Disability Studies here at the University on his work in Eastern Europe um, and particularly on guardianship issues, which was very new at that time. And I saw this advertised, or heard this advertised, 
And I have to confess that it, I think it's the only time I rearranged a class to go and hear somebody speaking because I just thought I can't miss <laughs> going to hear the person who wrote the articles that I've just read. Because they were so original and they were so powerful and they were very strongly evidence-based and academically, academically very extremely good. But the, the policy relevance of them and the human stories they told was, um, was just so beyond <laughs> anything I'd come across in the disability human rights literature at that point. Um, and I think Oliver has the, Oliver's career really has been driven by an, an incredible commitment and energy and passion to make a difference in the world, which he's done in, in a huge number of different ways. Um, it's a great privilege for us here in the university as academics and as students to have somebody who has contributed so much through litigation, through advocacy, and through the impact related things that we're all trying to do um, through the rest of his life. And I know we all have a huge amount to learn from Oliver and, um, and that we will continue to be inspired by Oliver and his scholarship and his, and his um, policy and campaigning work. So it's, it's tremendously exciting for all of us to have you here, Oliver, <laughs> and I won't step between you and the, the people who've come to hear you any longer. So um, I would like to hand over to you now. I think we should, yeah, clap for Oliver in welcome. <laughs> oh, stop it, stop it. Anna, <laughs> Sorry. Anna and Alistair, thank you both so very much for your um, overly generous uh, introduction. Um, convened to create a countrywide lobbying group on Dalit rights, the All India Depressed Classes Conference took place in Nagpur in July 1942. In a famous speech to that conference, the jurist Bimrao Ramji Ambedkar urged delegates to educate, agitate and organise. Have faith in yourself. With justice on our side, I do not see how we can lose our battle. The battle to me is a matter of joy. The battle is in the fullest sense spiritual. There's nothing material or social in it. For ours is a battle, not for, the wealth or not for wealth or power. It's a battle for freedom. It's a battle for the reclamation of human personality. Ambedkar was talking about reversing the injustices faced by Dalits, the untouchables who faced widespread discrimination. He, a Dalit himself, went on to chair the drafting group of the first constitution in India in 1950, the same year as the European Convention on Human Rights was adopted. In dictatorships and in democracies throughout history and even in the world today, we see that laws treat minorities differently. Laws that remove rights from the disadvantaged and laws that promulgate prejudice. My focus has been on children and adults with labels of mental health issues or intellectual disabilities. And oftentimes their discrimination, segregation and injustice is accepted by the public more than they are themselves. This evening I'd like to talk about this sense of anguish, but about two other things as well. About activism, how lawyers from law student to law firm partner can use their knowledge and power to engage in the struggle for social justice and about argument, how ideas are advanced and battles won through critical conversations, robust disagreement, deployment of norms, evidence and emotion. Modern human rights activism started in the 1970s and I was born bang in the middle of that decade. Fifteen days after I was born, the European Commission on Human Rights accepted the case of Winterwerp versus the Netherlands, which was to become the first European mental health case. That was not one of my cases. <laughs> Oliver Thorold here took the cases of Ashingdane in the mid-1980s and Johnson in the mid-1990s to Strasbourg, but there was very little else from any European country. Sir Nick Bratzer, the former UK judge at the European Court, 
uh, wrote a foreword to a book that Ollie and Peter Bartlett and I wrote almost a decade ago, noting that the jurisprudence of the court in the succeeding 20 years since Winterwerp is notable for the almost complete dearth of judicial decisions in this vitally important area. He went on to explain that this gap is a reflection not of adequate safeguarding by member states of the convention rights of those with mental disabilities, but rather of the acute practical and legal difficulties faced by an especially vulnerable group of people in asserting these rights and in bringing claims both before domestic courts and the European court. The US, as you'd expect, was a bit more litigious, but even cases by the prestigious Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law in DC neither drew from nor contributed to the development of international human rights law. And it's really been uh, only since the turn of the, this century that mental health, disability and international law have come together in any serious way. And the regional cases have pretty much all been from Europe. So it does seem strange that in the library here you'll find recent books by Stephen Hopgood called The End Time of Human Rights and Eric Posner's Twilight of Human Rights Law. Last week I was at a conference in London and the, UN, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Paul Hunt, was there. Twilight? He exclaimed. Dawn has just broken and we're barely out of bed. We are indeed at the early stages of this subject's intellectual and operational journey. Yet there have been advances, such as the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, adopted in 2006, the CRPD, that was driven by people with disabilities themselves. But the emerging body of case law exists in large measure as a result of a programme of sustained innovation by human rights litigators, with whom my organisation has worked. And it's with humility and huge gratitude that I dedicate this lecture to them. The Mental Disability Advocacy Centre was founded by George Soros's Open Society Institute to disrupt a system of disability segregation. It started in the spring of 2001 in Estonia when I was doing a pupillage in London. And by, so by some fluke, I'd been appointed as the legal director of this organisation. And I think 15 years ago to the day, I landed in freezing Tallinn, planning, of course, to come back to the bar a couple of years later. The best laid plans. In my first week in Estonia, I visited my first social care institution in the town of Valkla, half an hour drive from Tallinn. We were greeted by the director, a former Air Estonia flight attendant who was studying psychology. She'd been brought in following a scandal involving the previous director who ran an institution that the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, the CPT, said was pervaded by a pernicious culture of violence, where discipline and control were entrusted to staff having no specialised training who in turn delegated many of the more challenging tasks, like working with agitated or disturbed pa patients, to other patients. Valkla was my first taster of how victims of human rights violations were used as political pawns. The CPT had issued its report in 1997 on Valkla and other places of detention and released that to the Estonian government, but the government only authorised the publication in late 2002 right before Estonia acceded to the European Union, thus denying the public the chance to leverage change out of the system in those precious pre-accession years. By the time of my visit, there was less violence, but no shortage of neglect and abuse. We entered the building and it reeked of urine and detergent. Valkla housed 300 people who slept in bedrooms with four or five others, beds tightly packed together. Residents wore multiple layers of clothes as it was cold inside and sub-zero outside. They shared their clothes as well as soap and toothbrushes and they were allowed to wash once a week in a room which reminded me of a concentration camp. To enter the dining room, residents had to pass a nurse and swallow a pill before getting food. Medication time, gentlemen. Survival was contingent upon compliance with medication, a Foucauldian field trip. Just slop was served. People had no teeth. 
There was a locked seclusion room with a highly sedated person inside. A group of around 20 men with intellectual disabilities were locked together in a room which had green walls and wooden benches, but nothing else. This resident told us in fluent English how he'd been placed in the institution following a family dispute some years ago. He appreciated that he had somewhere to live, but he didn't want to live there. The institution was clearly horrible, but what was less clear to me was what this all had to do with the law. I had been asked to relocate to Budapest, much to my delight, in early 2002, and I spent that year visiting the eight Eastern European accession countries, marked in this map in orange, which, were, which exceeded in 2004, plus Bulgaria and Romania, which exceeded in 2007. I pooled the experts I know, who mostly are in this room, Jill P.A., Peter Bartlett, Ollie Thorold, and our current chair, Philippa Kaufman. And one of them joined me on each of the missions. In each country, we spent two days conducting site visits to social care institutions, prisons, children's homes, uh, psychi psychiatric hospitals, and so on. And we spoke to as many civil society and governmental people as possible. The two Olivers wrote a short training pack on the ECHR and mental disability, which was translated into the local languages and guided two-day seminars that we conducted. And those were often the first public events in the country which brought together the ideas of mental health and human rights. We still work with many of the NGOs um, who organized those seminars back there. The NGO Zelda in Latvia, the Polish Helsinki Federation for Human Rights, and the Center for Legal Resources in Romania, for example. My lens was the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR. And my knowledge, frankly, was limited to the book written by Leeds star alumni Keir Starmer, who opened this um, building and who is now doing a very important different job. Uh, the book is in was intended to build the capacity of UK lawyers as the 1998 Human Rights Act entered into force, but it was useful to this lawyer in exile in Eastern Europe too. So how did the European Convention on Human Rights illuminate what we saw and heard during that year? Well, the right to life, liberty, ill treatment, or freedom from, privacy, fair trial, property, assembly and expression, and of course intimate rights like sexual reproductive rights, rep marriage, and freedom from ill treatment were all engaged. And outside the ECHR, violations of economic and social rights, such as housing, health, mental health, but not, not only, social welfare and education were all on clear display. In addition to the ECHR, we had a couple of uh, UN instruments like the 1971 Mental Retardation Declaration and the 1991 Mental Illness Principles and a rather more promising 1999 document from the Council of Europe about incapable adults, but really um, the titles spoke for themselves. But standing back from what we saw, there were three, and there still are, three interlocking systems at play, mental health, social care, and guardianship. The mental health systems in many parts of Europe operate under the aegis of containment. People receive medication, often old style, with obvious side effects, but no talking therapies. Mental health is a closed system and shrouded in secrecy. It's better if we don't tell the patients about their diagnosis. I remember one Latvian psychiatrist telling me, withholding both information and power. Patients must comply with rigid, tr rigid treatment models that meet the needs of uh, the system, but ignore those of the patient. And the system is dead dominated by the medical model approach that favors chemistry over psychology, regime over recovery, coercion over consent, segregation over inclusion, and paperwork over justice. And law theoretically regulates the psychiatric system, admission, discharge, complaints, reviews, but in reality, service providers can safely ignore these pesky regulations. Lawyers and judges had never demonstrated that they added any value. After the transition to democracy in Central Eastern Europe, American, well-intentioned American lawyers had consulted governments to redraft their mental health laws, but writing in legal safeguards was doomed to failure in countries where there was no culture of checks and balances. So requiring a judge to glance at papers, unsurprisingly, resulted in zero change to the patient's experience. And all it did was add a veneer of legal legitimacy, which, in my view, is worse than a system of arbitrariness. 
I remember discussing with a Romanian psychiatrist about the new mental health law in that country. He didn't know what the basics were, yet this was the law which was designed specifically to regulate his everyday practice. In psychiatry, people are in hospital for a few weeks or maybe a few months, but it's in the social care system where we find an altogether different set of problems. During my tour, a powerful image emerged of institutionalised people hidden from the public's gaze who had been neglected for a very long time. No official data exists, but we estimate that within the Council of Europe region, there are upwards of two million people with mental health issues or intellectual disabilities who are warehoused for life. 20 years ago, the policy focused on children and countries like Romania made great strides in reducing the numbers of non-disabled children who were warehoused. Perhaps because, as arch human rights skeptic Stephen Hopgood has suggested, the suffering child embodies the central figure of liberal humans where innocence is a proxy for naturalness, guilelessness, blamelessness. And in this way, both compassion and justice can be anchored on the child, but not so for adults who were seen as defectives, deviants, unpredictable and invalid invalids. There is nothing social, caring or homely about a social care home. And what we see now is the phenomena of trans institutionalization of creating smaller institutions as if that's a better solution. We see institutions that have been renovated and yes, a plastered wall is better than an unplastered wall. But the point is that people never leave. I've seen several institutions with a room at the end of the corridor of bedrooms, which is used to lay out a body when a resident dies so that others can pay their respects. The person is then buried in the grounds of the institution. Even in death, liberty is denied. Social care institutions are characterised by regimes of endless empty days, boredom leading to frustration and punishment, helplessness and hopelessness. I always ask management how many people could live in the community. Mm, 20 or 30 percent, they usually say, betraying a defensiveness about the status quo and a crushing lack of creativity. These institutions pose a huge challenge to human rights litigators. Cases mostly require victims, yet residents are still under the thumb of the system and the risk of retribution is high. Plus, most residents are all under the, or most residents are under the elephant in the continent, which is guardianship. In modern international law, the legal authority to act is called legal capacity, but deprivation of legal capacity through the device of guardianship has its roots in Roman law. In those days, guardianship was a mechanism to benefit others. If an insane person was to inherit property, a sandal-wearing guardian was appointed, and if there was none, the person's relative had to take charge of his property. Insane people were equated with children. Yes, they could choose which toga to wear today, but any more substantial decisions um, were, were taken away. And this history explains why uh, law professors, as well as judges, beloved of ancient and useless concepts as they are, bloody law professors, have been the chief blockers of uh, efforts to reform the law in countries like Czech Republic, Bulgaria and elsewhere. Thomas Hammerberg, the former Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, nailed it when he said that without legal capacity we're non-persons in the eyes of the law and our decisions have no legal force. So how does the system work? In most, cases, in most countries across Europe, statutes are incredibly broad. If you can't manage your daily affairs, then you shall be placed under guardianship. The, the opinion of one doctor is required and a judge declares the person incapable. The supposedly incapable person is not always required or, or invited to attend court and is not otherwise heard. No counter evidence is presented and there's no probing of the flimsy evidence itself. Some jurisdictions have partial guardianship but most laws assume that the person is universally incapable. Um, so that means that the person can be placed into a faraway institution. The guardian can block court proceedings if the person wants to get out of guardianship, and the guardian can even block a complaint about himself. Their signatures being invalid, people under guardianship are prohibited from working. 
or they're placed in sheltered workshops where their skills are not developed and they don't even earn a proper wage. Even the right to vote is removed, reducing political visibility and making it harder to imagine political progress on more substantive rights. Guardianship protects money and power. An outdated normative framework conspires with the very worst of psychiatry to anaesthetise human agency. One of MDAC's most impactful achievements was to call this system out and to put, it, put guardianship on the human rights uh, map through a series of reports that we wrote and, and our litigation from 2006 onwards. But even with this evidence base, we knew that wishful thinking alone would not change the plight of the people under guardianship that we met. It became obvious that guardianship was the slip road to segregation, and we went after this as a strategic priority. Pavel Stukaturov was a 24-year-old man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who lived with his mother in St. Petersburg in Russia. One day at home, he found a piece of paper, a court order, dated the previous year, removing his legal capacity and placing him under the guardianship of his mother. It was the first he had heard about it. He went to Google and searched for help. Do you see how incapable he was? He found Dmitry Bartonov, a very smart lawyer in St. Petersburg who works with our organization. Dmitry met with Pavel and they signed a power of attorney. A couple of weeks later, Pavel called Dmitry. In a rushed phone call, he explained that he's been taken into psychiatric hospital number six, not one of St. Petersburg's, uh, St. Peter's, St. Peterburg's most uh, beautiful buildings. Um, and he said that he had been detained there and he requested Dmitry to go and help him. Uh, I happened to be in St. Petersburg at that time. So um, in the visiting hours in the afternoon, it was dark already and frankly quite spooky. Uh, the hospital's mortuary was signposted on the ground floor and the security guard's Alsatian dog, decidedly more deadly looking than Ufti, <laughs> was roaming around unleashed on the ground floor. So we legged it up to the second floor where Pavel was detained. Dmitri asked the charge nurse, I'd like to see Pavel Shukatorov, please, he's my client. Uh, she said, look, it's not visiting hours. Um, and he said, well, yes, it is. And anyway, I'm not really a visitor, I'm his lawyer. He, uh, she replied, look, he can't have a lawyer because he's under guardianship. You should go and speak to his mum. So the, the law was that the, the, the guardian could authorise the so-called voluntary detention and forced treatment, bypassing the legal process that also then required a court review. It was, of course, a legal fiction, and however comic it looked on the outside, we knew that Pavel was being forcibly treated on the inside. When the authorities block access between a lawyer and their client, alarm bells start to go off. So we applied to the European Court of Human Rights, to grant, uh, which granted um, interim relief, uh, telling the Russian authorities to allow access between Pavel and Dmitry. This made mini legal history as it was the first interim order in a non-deportation and a non-emergency life is at stake case. Of course, the authorities failed to comply and Dmitry was kept out. The St. Petersburg Bar Council threatened to disbar Dmitry for outrageously bringing disrepute onto the integrity of Mother Russia's mental health system. But we ploughed on winning the case in Strasbourg some months later. It was the court's big first big guardianship case, which ruled that guardianship amounted to a very serious interference with Pavel's right to private life under Article 8 of the ECHR, and found the system where one person can authorise the detention and forced treatment of another person to violate the convention. Back in Russia, we continued the litigation, taking a case to the Constitutional Court, which then quashed three areas of Russian law, including the legal ability of a court of guardian to authorise detention. This was the first higher court legal capacity judgment in any former Soviet Union country. So through a combination of international law and domestic legal action, we caused a change in the law. But soon afterwards, a notification from the St. Petersburg Bar Council landed on Dmitri's desk. He opened it to find a note explaining that they were so proud of their star member that they've bestowed upon him a special award in recognition of his outstanding achievements in advocating for the rights of people with mental disabilities. 
This case wrested power from the fading nobility of Soviet psychiatry and was a reimagining of a just mental health system. But it did so without a vibrant movement of activists behind the litigation, and that's been a problem for us. While travelling around the region, I spoke to many NGOs and, and people used to say, well, we do human rights, not disability rights. There were few NGOs of people with mental health issues and zero of people with intellectual disabilities who were represented by their parents who have a slightly different take on things than their offspring. Civil society was precarious and fragile. People under guardianship were prohibited in law from establishing or joining NGOs, so were barred from organising a challenge to their oppression. The plight of human rights defenders is now worse. In Russia, internationally collaborating NGOs are labelled as foreign agents and prosecuted and shut down. And even today, Amnesty's uh, office in Moscow um, was raided and sealed up. Many more, across the many more NGOs across the region that receive funding to run services for people with disabilities don't do advocacy anymore for fear that their funding base would be cut. The Stukatorov case is an example of strategic litigation. So what is this all about? Well, otherwise known as impact or test case litigation, it's a method that seeks not only a win for the individual client, but also to change the position of others, the court, obviously, and the, often the government and other civil society groups as well. Strategic litigation plays a documentation role. Judicial findings are seen as balanced and unbiased and carry more weight than reports of NGOs or even national human rights institutions. And our strategy has always been to frame disability rights within mainstream civil and political rights like fair trials and freedom from ill treatment, deploying concepts like proportionality, uh, arbitrariness and discrimination. Uh, these claims help challenge the unhelpful view held by many policymakers in the pu public and lawyers that disability is just a social issue or that it belongs to the UN's Disability Committee and has nothing to do with other specialist committees on, for example, economic, social, cultural rights or the specialist conventions on torture, women, children. The beauty of human rights litigation, a point I'll come back to, is that it creates an asymmetric battle, which I find somewhat wonderful. The otherwise passive and helpless victim is a role which is transformed into one of strength. The person becomes emblematic of others' plight, starring in a universal narrative of the meek against the powerful. And I've seen how this empowering effect benefits the litigant in profound ways, even when they receive no material benefit from the litigation. Litigation has a trickle-out effect too, by creating an invitation to the policy table where none existed, and by being a catalyst for law and policy reform. Litigation protects and defends and expands the space in which social movements operate and can inspire nascent movements to organise. An example is our case of Stanev versus Bulgaria. By the way, these two case examples both concern men. Gender-based violence is rife, and our litigators everywhere have found it more difficult to attract female uh, litigant, female women to sign up as litigants. And we're implementing a strategy funded by the UN uh, Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture to address this. Last week's conviction in Moldova of a rapist, uh, sorry, of a psychiatrist who raped 16 of his female patients over the course of a decade is an example. When he was in his mid 40s, Rusi Stanev was living at home. He had a mental health diagnosis as one in four or more of people around the world do, but he was coping fine. In 2002, on the 12th of December, ironically, World Human Rights Day, he was taken from his home and driven 400 kilometres to an institution called the Pastra Care Home for Adults with Mental Disorders. And like Pavel, behind his, behind his back, Rusi had been placed under the guardianship of someone else, and his guardian had arranged a transfer, transfer to this institution. There he found terrible conditions. Freezing winters resulted in a 10% mortality rate he had to share a bedroom with other men. He saw some of them die.
but he, he survived. He escaped and was brought back. He wrote letters to various authorities, but to no avail. Fortunately for him, a Bulgarian NGO, the Bulgarian Helsinki Committee, was carrying out human rights monitoring in that institution. And their monitors met Rusi, who asked them to help him get out. We worked with the Helsinki Committee and appealed unsuccessfully in the Bulgarian system. Effectively, the judges said, Mr. Stanev, get out of my courtroom. You're under guardianship, so you lack legal standing. So we applied to the European Court of Human Rights. Unusually, there was an oral hearing before the seven-judge chamber, and we flew Rusi over to Strasbourg. The chamber sensed the importance of this case as it challenged the setup of the entire social care system in Europe. So it bumped the case up to the 17-judge grand chamber, which also held an oral hearing. And in 2012, six years after we applied, the Grand Chamber delivered its judgment. It found a violation of Article 3 of the ECHR, freedom from torture and ill treatment, for the degrading conditions of the institution. That's the first successful invocation of that provision in any disability case. It also found a violation of the right to liberty under Article 5, the first ever violation in a social care case. We had argued that Russi's right to a fair trial under Article 6 of the Convention was violated, as was his private life under Article 8, as a result of the guardianship. The court agreed with the former, but found no separate issue arose under the latter. Perhaps at 61 pages, the judges had ran out of steam. The court's handling of that part of the claim stood in sharp contrast to the Stukatarov uh, decision. In her dissent, the Bulgarian judge, Judge Kaladeva, regretted that the court failed to look into that point. She correctly, in my view, identified legal capacity as the primary issue in the case. She noted how the government offered no justification for ignoring Mr. Stanis' preferences, and that instead of due assistance from his officially appointed guardian, the pursuit of his best interests was made completely dependent on the goodwill or neglect shown by the guardian. She observed, and she would know, how but the Bulgarian law failed to meet contemporary standards for ensuring the necessary respect for the wishes and preferences he was capable of expressing. That's code for Article 12 of the CRPD, the, Conven the UN Con Disability Convention, that sets out how everyone has the right to legal capacity and requires governments to make assistance available to those who need it in exercising their legal capacity. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the US Supreme Court, has said that dissents speak to a future age. So I'm confident that the court will in a future age, maybe next year, find violations of the substance of guardianship and institutionalization, not just the procedural points. The Bulgarian social care system incarcerates 7,000 people with disabilities, most of whom are 85%, in fact, are under guardianship. So this case should have an impact on all of them. The court, in its judgment, told the government to ensure the effective possibility of people under guardianship accessing courts. Given that many countries have exactly the same system, the general measures ordered by the Strasbourg court are of great significance. And so we use this as a hook to mount pressure on the government. The historian of human rights, Samuel Moyne, has argued that has suggested that agendas for the world are argued in terms of morality. We've also found that non-normative arguments clinch um, uh, discussions too. Sorry about that, law students. Um, law's really important, but it's not the only thing. So courts are only ever going to be, in our experience, part of the answer. So how have we combined litigation with advocacy? Well, after a judgment at the European Court, the file is taken across the road to the rather beautiful Agora building, which I often think looks quite similar to this building. And that's where the Committee of Ministers Secretariat is housed. And last year, the government responded to the Committee of Ministers by submitting an action plan explaining how an amendment already passed gave people in institutions fair trial rights. That's wholly incorrect. And that a draft law would plug the other gaps that the court found. In February this year, we went to Sofia and met with several 
senior governmental um, of officials, including ministers and judges, to do our bit to support the draft law, which at that time was being opposed by the, the Ministry of Social Affairs. And we're fortunate to have an amazing uh, lawyer, a litigator, Aneta Genova, um, who took the, the Stanov case and all of our Bulgarian cases. And she and we have been working with Nadia Shabani of the Bulgarian Centre for Non-Profit Law and Valentina Christakeva of GIP Sofia to disrupt the system from inside the country. And they're all doing an amazing job. And in March this year, we went to Strasbourg and met with diplomats. We briefed diplomats at the Committee of Ministers and urged them to put pressure on the Bulgarian government to pass the draft law. We also met with secretariat officials and followed that up uh, a month later with what's called a Rule 9 submission. I won't bore you with the details. In June, the Committee of Ministers published its report, drawing very heavily from our submission. It encouraged the government to, among other things, take steps to give people under guardianship direct access to courts. And in July, Niels Mwizhniks, the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights urged the government to take action to pass a law that would finally recognise people's human dignity and treat them as equal with other citizens. The Steinov case is an example of where a judgment allowed civil society to build a framework to hold the government to account. It sparked others to campaign for permanent structural reform and co by combining domestic and international uh, advocacy, I'm pleased to say that a legal capacity bill has now been laid before the Bulgarian parliament. Um, so for the first time in international law, the 2006 CRPD has articulated the right to live independently and be included in the community, as well as the right to legal capacity. Those don't, rights don't really exist or at least haven't been articulated like that elsewhere. The CRPD has created a universe somewhat parallel to the ECHR, other UN treaties and their treaty bodies, and the European and Global Torture Prevention bodies. And NGOs uh, negotiating with states uh, before the CRPD was adopted, of course wanted to combat the widespread human rights violations, and they urged the pendulum to swing heavily to the other side, which perhaps explains the recommendation by the CRPD committee to prohibit any form of substituted decision-making in any circumstance. Academia can, I think, play an enhanced role in widening out this debate by providing a somewhat richer evidence base so that the conversation moves beyond dogmatic norms and cherry-picked personal testimonies. Lord Gough warned in a lecture in 1983 um, against the temptation of elegance the compulsion to state principles in so succinct a way as to bar the possibility of qualifications or exceptions as yet unperceived. So what does that mean for strategic human rights litigation? How is the European Court of Human Rights integrating the CRPD? Well, rather torturously, I recently researched all of the Strasbourg cases that have ever cited the CRPD. Thanks, Anna. There are 34 proper cases, once you knock out the kind of uh, ones which just cited in an irrelevant footnote, 34. A tiny number compared to the court's overall output. During the period that the CRPD has been in force, the court has delivered over 11,000 judgments. So 34 judgments is a grand 0.3% of the total output. It takes up to six years for the court to adjudicate a case so given the fact that the CRPD entered into force in 2008 and other countries ratified it after that, and bearing in mind the myriad access to justice barriers preventing arguable cases from ever reaching the court's intray, a point which Nick Bratzer made, it's understandable that there have been, there's been a slow uptake on disability rights cases in which applicants' lawyers feel that the CRPD has something to add. But leaving aside the homeopathic concentration of disability cases, is there any evidence of an ECHR CRPD judicial osmosis? Well, what I found was a court reluctant to engage with the CRPD. Where it cites the CRPD, it does so without any real integration in its legal reasoning. And if the court disagrees with the CRPD or its interpretation by the CRPD committee, is less inclined to rely on it or even cite it. 
explaining the reasons would take me on a, a tangent. So please read my chapter in Anna Lawson and Lisa Waddington's book when it comes out next year and once I've submitted the next draft. <laughs> Bringing this back to the themes of argumentation and activism, I found something in the research that came as quite a surprise. And that is that the majority of CRPD cited cases were those where civil society played a role, either as a representative of the applicant or as a third party intervener. The number of times a case is cited by other cases is a proxy indicator of the importance of that case, right? Recall that my data set was 34 Strasbourg judgments that have cited the CRPD and recall too how the 2008 judgment of Stukatorov, which didn't cite the CRPD, was the first legal capacity case in modern times, if you like. It is the most cited disability uh, judgment by the data set cases, 12 out of the 34 cases cited. And remember, remember too that the data set contains cases that have nothing to do with mental health or intellectual disability, disability more broadly. In second place is the Stanev case, which did cite the CRPD itself, and it was cited by 11 of the 34 uh, data set cases. So I guess my tentative conclusion there is that an investment into Strasbourg test case litigation is having some impact on the development of the court's boutique disability jurisprudence. Strategic litigation is a multidisciplinary venture because it uses not only norms but empirical evidence and emotion. It aims to achieve legal victory but also aims to shift the attitudes and behaviours of others. As such, I suggest that the enterprise has a certain aesthetic. In 1973, the composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein gave a lecture in Harvard on Gustav Mahler's terrifying otherworldly Ninth Symphony. Bernstein remarked that all of the truly great works of our century have been born of despair or of protest or of a refuge from both, but anguish informs them all. I've despaired at Valkler, at Pastra, at cage beds, shackles, abandonment, violence. I've been distressed by the incompetence of some governmental representatives and been incredibly frustrated at the weakness of international accountability for human rights violations. And this anguish poses a dilemma. We can walk away and ignore other people's despair because it's actually not our problem. Or we can channel our anguish into a creative work, perhaps not always a great work, but a work perhaps nonetheless of beauty. Recall how the Dalits' battle for justice was for Ambedkar a matter of joy and the reclamation of human personality. I lived in the Jewish quarter in Budapest for 12 years and became quite affected by the music of Gustav Mahler. His work laid out his battles and contradictions in his environment and he used influences from the West and from the East. He produced soaring melodies and despairing discord. He identified as a Jew and a Christian. He created intimate chamber music and massive orchestral sound all in the same piece. And his work signalled an end to classicism and an opening up into modernism, a radically different worldview for which there was no blueprint, no method, no detail. And of course, law lends itself to easy, simplistic binaries, claim, counterclaim, guilty, not guilty, win, lose, and so on. But I think there's a much more delicate balance, an altogether finer line, a, a quiet, single, sustained note between segregation and inclusion, between loneliness and support, and between poverty and justice. And I would suggest that today's social justice agitators are, like Mahler, observers and co-creators of some profound historical transformation. 
It is, after all, a big ask for the civilizing force of the law to embrace the full spectrum of humanity, not just for the privileged, abled, valid. The phrase paradigm shift is hackneyed and overused in disability rights discourse. We can't possibly expect a Mandela walking out of prison moment signaling the end of apartheid or a Berlin Wall falling down, bringing an end to communism. Change comes incrementally and unexpectedly. Viva la evolution. My point is that we owe it to the sustainability of our own mental well-being to guard against shouldering responsibility for such a profound social shift. My point is also that it's important to punctuate the arc of as yet unwritten history with celebrations of small successes. The loudest symphony is, after all, made from small, silent notes. The title of this lecture is Disabling Legal Barriers, and I've suggested by, that by rummaging in the legal toolbox, we can find things to, to dismantle barriers to equality, inclusion, and justice. Destruction clears the path for renewal and regrowth, another Marlarian theme. But we need to do more than dismantle barriers. Someone needs to provide the evidence about what works. Someone needs to establish the reasonable measures that governmental authorities and others have to take. Someone needs to work with local communities and someone needs to monitor the progress. Law can be an instrument to secure human rights institutionally, but it's rarely enough to change human behavior. Other social arrangements are required for the full right realization of rights, including public policy and social pressure. Building a structure from the rubble of injustice requires a multidisciplinary effort. So I'm particularly looking forward to working with colleagues across the university, with Angarad Beckett and others from the Centre for Disability Studies, with John Baker from Health, and colleagues from economics, education, media, and business. Domains that litigation and advocacy initiatives can work with, I think, more effectively. In the new year, MDAC will be rebranding and relaunching, and we'll be in a position to engage leads students in our work as we move several staff from Budapest to be based here uh, during the summer. And shifting our headquarters to the university marks a, marks a significant milestone in our charity's development. And I'd like to thank Peter Bartlett, Felicity Callard, and our current chair, Philippa Kaufman, uh, and all of the other trustees, including Jean Barclay here today, our newest trustee, for steering us this far. I'm also hugely grateful uh, to the leadership of the School of Law. Lord Colin Lowe, who chairs the school's advisory uh, uh, council, Alistair Mullis, uh, Joan Lockery, Michael Thompson, Julie Wallbank, and all of the members of the uh, Centre for Law and Social Justice in extending an invitation for me to join the school, for believing in the institutional collaboration and for being such supportive and motivating colleagues. Robert Louis Stevenson said that we shouldn't judge each day by the harvest we reap, but by the seeds we plant. I've been teaching a course in the Central European University in Budapest for 13 years now to postgraduate law students, a course on mental disability law and advocacy. And at least seven of my former students are now leading mental disability rights advocates. They are all as impressive as their names are unpronounceable. <laughs> Ines Bulic. Amina Czerminovic, Konstantin Kojikariu, Oana Gilescu, Eong Louise Mabuen, Barbara Mirhesh, Marcin Schwed. As proud as I am of them, I look forward to incubating more agitators to be here in Leeds by teaching a new LLM module on global human rights advocacy and picking up a few classes in both the LLM and LLB disability law modules. I'm humbled to join such a supportive and collaborative teaching and learning environment headed up by Nick Taylor. This year, as you've heard, we've launched a disability law hub under Anna's leadership, and I look forward very much to spending more time with her and fellow hubbists, Luke Clemens, in the back. 
Gautier de Becco, Beverly Clough, Louise Ellison, uh, Amanda Keeling, David Pierce, and Cesar Ramirez Montes, as well as the LLM students and, of course, PhD candidates. Thank you for all the work you do and for giving me an opportunity to work alongside you. I'd like to pay a massive tribute to my teachers and mentors too, many of whom are here today. Jill P.A. who taught me at LSE, Geneva Richardson who taught me more about policy and politics, Oliver Thorold who got me into this mess way back then, Peter Bartlett who sidled up to me at a conference in Toronto in, in 1999, and the rest is history. <laughs> Michael Bach in Canada and Art Hendricks in the Netherlands. Thank you for your support, wisdom, and buying the drinks. <laughs> Thank you all. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> Don't clap between movements. <laughs> Thanks to my family, to my mum, um, who's a psychiatrist, who met Alan, my stepfather, who's um, what, both retired, a, ma a manager in the NHS, and they learnt in a very romantic way by both shutting down several psychiatric or learning disability institutions in Bristol, and I learnt from them that service provider intrapreneurs means change happens quicker because it doesn't need to be provoked from the outside. And thanks too to Istvan for many things, including putting the PowerPoint together. <laughs> Finally, students past present and future. Your life can have meaning even if you go into commercial law. <laughs> Whatever field you choose or chooses you, you can, and you better, support social causes that you care about. Insist on your firm allowing you to do pro, pro bono cases. Be an active alumnus of this school. Help your favourite charities by setting up thoughtful direct debits on a monthly basis. <laughs> Provide strategic advice. Become a trustee. Be an ambassador. Do not hide behind what it says on your business card. Use your privileged position to contribute to social impact because the true measure of your character is how you treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, and the condemned. I've suggested today that concerns of social justice can be addressed by the exchange of ideas through legal activism and by engaging in critical conversations. Conversations in the power uh, corridors with decision makers, in coffee shops with potential helpful allies, and yes, in dreadful UN meetings. Judicial accountability will remain an important last resort, so critical courtroom conversations will remain crucial. The post-war human rights project enjoins us to prefer persuasion over violence and we must therefore listen and understand the concerns of our opponents. We need not be afraid of convening diverse opinions and we must inter interrogate what's worked and what hasn't and find out the reasons why. We know from Pavel and from Rusi and from many others about the consequences of failing to enable and support people to live in the community with choices equal to others. We need arguments to help create systems that take into account the wildly differing contexts, cultures, traditions, resources and practices around the world. And as much as we argue legitimately about the detail, let's be grounded in uh, the principles agreed through consensus in international law which must guide operational behaviour, inclusion, respect for diversity, non-discrimination, accessibility, support and dignity. Rusi Stanev put it in a less convoluted way. On the way to Strasbourg for his chamber hearing in 2010, he said in Bulgarian, I'm not an object. I'm a person. I need my freedom. The deprivation of his legal capacity had reduced his destiny to his diagnosis. Under guardianship, his personhood had been stripped bare, and as a result, he was denied his freedom. 
Reversing the discrimination embedded in legal systems requires many critical conversations about our motivating anguish, about what it means to author our own lives, and about the activism needed to establish a more just and inclusive society. But please do join in. Those conversations have begun, but they've only just begun. Thank you very much. Thanks.